In our last video, we met the leaders of the Ossiarch Bone Reapers. And in that video, I divided those units into those that I said lead the beast, meaning that they are the, the martial might of the Bone Reapers, and those that feed the beast, right? The mortisons and craftsmen soldiers uh, who make things from the bones and souls of the vanquished, and they keep this war machine going, right? Lead the beast. Feed the Beast, the Beast being, of course, Nagash's undying plans uh, to conquer the mortal realms. I absolutely love it, and I think that they're incredibly interesting, and today we're going to talk about the Beast itself, right? The boots on the ground army that is the Ossiarc Bone Reapers, as we explore the various units that make up its legions. Now, as always, when it comes to talking about the individual units within an army, right, not every unit has the same amount of lore, and there isn't enough artwork in the book to give me like a full spread on every single unit. So, as I've been doing lately, I'll throw the pics of the model that I'm talking about when I get to their section, but everything else is pretty much just for ambiance, so buckle in, grab your paintbrush, and let's talk about the various units that make up this faction. We'll start at the bottom here with the lowliest warrior, and that is the Mortec Guard. And I say lowly, that's a very like misleading term, right? Because actually my favorite description from them is, is the first sentence in their entry in the battle tome, and that is, each Mortec Guard is a walking mass grave. I love it. I love the darkness in that line. The book is continually referencing the resources it takes to make the army happen, right? Even that the lowliest soldier on the totem pole, as it were, is a composite of dozens of bodies of bones and several souls ripped apart and put back together. Each is a graveyard given this kind of unlife. And as we mentioned before, they do have a little bit of autonomy. They are not mindless drones. And the extent of their independence is pretty much limited to how they conduct themselves in warfare. But that allows them to think creatively about how best to crush an enemy, how best to solve a problem, things like that. So they're not really like bound to this tight leadership structure in battle. Uh, like you would see with other, you know, some legions of Nagash, if they're led by a necromancer, he really is the focal point of all the independent thinking that happens in that army, right? The skeletons don't go to secure the right flank unless he commands them to. But in this army, the Ossiarc Bone Reapers, they have the autonomy to make battle plans happen in responsive time on the fly. Each of these units has their own what's called Hecatos. This is like a little like sergeant for the unit, uh, like a little mini boss jammed inside of the unit itself. And so even if the leaders fall, right, the actual mortisons and, and all the people leading the army, they still have their Hecatos. And even if the Hecatos falls uh, by some weird circumstance, they are independently smart enough to figure out the best solution to their problem and get out of that tough situation. They just kind of keep going, keep responding to what's happening on the battlefield. And Nagash, like, specifically designed them to, you know, to take a word from 40k, no, no fear. They literally cannot feel the urge to run away. And so that kind of plays into the lore where none of these units take battle shock tests. And uh, people have various opinions about that, but I think it really fits the theme of, like, when you're already dead and you have been divorced from the concept of fear on a soul level, you're not gonna run away. Now, their main role within the army itself is to act as the main fighting body and specifically to protect all the heroes we mentioned in the previous video. Because if those heroes fall, the army's ability to repair itself and grow, like we mentioned in the previous videos, it slows way down. And these make a great kind of bulwark, right? Like a defensive structure that can move and be responsive because on command, they can lock into an impenetrable shield wall. And they're able to repel all but the biggest targets, like the big beasts and the big, you know, the, whatever the, the hammer of the ar enemy army is, that might be able to tear through some of them. But the fact is they're meant to be this mobile fortification when they lock their shields. Now our next unit here, for those of us who played AOS before the, the book, this book's release, and even at the very tail end of 8th edition, the Morgasts, right? The Morgasts are a unit that is a familiar sight if you've been around for a little bit of a time here. And these are the ultimate honor guard of Nagash himself, the very first of his bone constructs, as kind of was later developed into an entire faction, the Ossiarch Bone Reapers. 
and they go as far back as the old world. You can kind of consider them a test bed for this army. What is certain is that it takes a lot more work to go into their creation than a standard Ossiarch Bone Reaper unit. Each one of them has a piece of the underworld itself embedded in their chest, just exuding death magic. And while they may seem incredibly slow and dim-witted, they are exceptional in combat. Like I said, they are the shock troops, the honor guard, everything for Nagash. But even in the, the big title, you know, capital M Morgast, there are actually two different kinds of them. They break down into different roles and both are very important. The Morgast Archai act as the bodyguards. And these aren't the only bodyguards this faction has access to. We'll talk about the other one later on. But these, obviously, in addition to protecting the leaders and, and keeping them safe, they have another vital role. They act as constant sources of information for Nagash. So if any leader that they come into contact with or they're following says anything that conflicts with the will of Nagash, the Archai will deliver swift judgment before those words are even finished. So they are a protector, sure, thumbs up, but they're also a constant reminder of who's in charge, that you're never fully trusted, right? Only Nagash himself trusts himself, right? Nobody else can even measure up. So it keeps champions on their toes about what they do with the limited freedom that they are given. Now, the other unit uh, that goes under kind of the, the heading, I guess you could say, of Morgast are the Harbingers. And these uh, are the offensive focused unit, right? Where the Archai are about defense, Harbingers are about offense. And uh, despite their appearance, they move at incredible speeds and can break the heart of the enemy line. And honestly, the book doesn't say much about them outside of that. It's just a real emphasis on their speed. You can kind of sum it up this way, where the Archai are the defenders and stewards of Nagash, the Harbingers are his fist, right? The one that reaches out into the enemy and crushes it. Now, the next unit today is the Kavalos Death Riders. And I got to say, these are my favorite model-wise. Absolutely. Right? These are the shock cavalry and the bloodhounds of Nagash. Incredible warriors with devastating mounts on the charge. And the cool bit of lore about them is that rarely other societies will actually see the Death Riders until they are in super trouble. Right? You don't, they don't show the Death Riders when they're coming up to say, hey, we're the Ossiarch Bone Reapers, here's the deal, you're going to give us your bones or we're going to destroy you, right? They're not even in the picture at that point. They're not who you're dealing with. You don't see them, you don't know they exist. You find out that they exist if you break the contract or you reject the tithe. And then you're going to start to see what looks like, you know, oh, look, our friends are coming on horseback. They can help us out, repel these stupid undead. And then you slowly realize that, they're not moving that fast, they're kind of just trotting along, but as they get closer, you see that they are just huge, horrific, and they are the fist of Nagash. Like I said, they are his shock cavalry, but also his bloodhounds, because they will chase their prey down to the ends of the earth. They don't need to sleep, right? They just keep going day and night, and so you can, like, you know, scramble and try to run away, but they will catch you. Only breaking into a full gallop on the charge, which is meant to both smash the main battle line of the enemy and also shatter their resolve by casting this aura of dread to anyone nearby because they're so stinking scary. Now, a lot of their entry is actually focused more on the mounts than it is on the actual rider. I mean, the rider is basically everything we've talked about here before, which is a composite of different skeletons and the best, you know, cavalry champions ever put into one, right? It's, 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 Hard to not make it sound boring, but honestly, there there kind of is a template that they fit into. But the mounts are something that's a little bit unique. Because when I was wondering when I saw this army for the first time, right, I was wondering why they even used undead horses at all, right? If he can just make a, a new type of warrior, why not have like a centaur or something, right? You know, the man's of, hands of a man and then the body of a horse, that kind of thing. Well... The horses are made of composite bones and souls too. These souls are a combination of historic steeds, unrelenting war horses, and even the wild beasts of the realm. So try to imagine ripping the soul out of something like a maw crusher and jamming it into something the size of a horse. It's gonna have that same ferocity with it. However, it's not just that. And this is the kind of the point where I think to myself, it makes more sense to have it be a separate, like um 
a lesser creature. And the reason I say that is because any champion who rebels against Nagash or fails him enough can be put inside one of these horses. So you are like a subjugated creature and you have just enough like wherewithal mentally to know exactly what's happening, right? You, you have enough of a brain to grasp your own shame and punishment. And yet you are bound to do this service. And so you are, you are a horse now. And that's the, that's the life that you get to have for eternity because you screwed up. A servant, a beast of burden, a creature who's always moving, never gets rest and never gets rewarded. So they're not only part of this like deadly unit, right? Which because, you know, the Capitalist Death Riders, they, they are incredibly powerful unit, but this unit also serves as a very practical reminder of the cost of failure. Always reminding with the little monicum of freedom that they have, right? Reminding all in the Ossiarc Bone Reapers, you are just playthings to Nagash. He can make you beasts of burden and mindless creatures, and you will know with horror that you are nothing anymore. And now we're going to move into what the book calls the War Giants of Ossia. And this is the last four entries in this entire battle tome. And it showcases what the, the deviant minds of the Mortisons came up with, right? Remember I said before when we're talking about the leaders that the Mortisons were like taken from predominantly, not all exclusively, but a lot of them were taken from this afterlife of artisans and craftsmen and engineers making marvels and, and incredible artwork, right? Well, what happens when you take that mind and you put it to the resources and the military structure of the Ossiarch Bone Reapers. Pretty soon, they were not just concerned with making the human form, right? The Mortet Guard are, are incredible warriors, but they're fundamentally, even though they're composite of many people, well, many people's worth of bones at least, they look relatively humanoid, right? We can all agree on that. Same thing for the, the knights and the riders. They can be made of different souls, but fundamentally, they look something that we recognize. It's only when the, the Mortisons really got to grasp their new situation and the materials that they were working with that they kind of broke away from that constraint of the human form. Their creativity led them to create incredible deathless horrors. Custom crafted to fulfill an express purpose within the army. And we're going to start the discussion of these with the Necropolis Stalkers. This is the, the larger, the super tall warrior with four heads. All right, he's big. He's an embodiment of the word blender. He stands far taller than the average human, and they lunge with this unnatural like vigor across the battlefield. Where the rest of the army is very slow and plodding, these are the shock troops once the battle closes in, right? Remember the, the Mortet Guard are forming a shield wall around all the leaders, but that entire like unit, right? The leaders in the Mortet Guard are moving forward very slowly and aggressively. They can't be broken, but they're slower. What happens is the Necropolis Stalkers, when they get close enough, just launch themselves fanatic style into the fray. And they're able to chop up little like um, weak, weak points within the enemy line. And then the, the, the longer, line of Mortet Guard just come and sweep over them, basically. They are armed with a wide variety of weapons, and they have four arms to wield a whole combination of them. And uniquely, they have a mask, which is called, I'm going to just try and pronounce this, the Quarjark Mask. And simply put, each side is an amalgamation of great warriors, right? Where, where every other Ossiarch Bone Reaper has like one sole composite put inside of them, the Mortisons designed these to be Okay, what's the best soul we could possibly make for being on the offense? Okay, what's the best soul that we can make possibly for being the most precise when it comes to, you know, enemies that only have a single weakness or something like that? And they just took four of these and jammed them inside one giant body. So they're each, you know, it's like four souls in one. They're each focused on a specific fighting style. And in this way, the stalkers can be both aggressive, right? Charging headlong into the fight, being little blenders, but also simultaneously being very reactionary, changing tactics fluently as the battle goes on. And those, those four broad categories that I'm talking about is called the blade strike aspect, the blade parry, which is more defensive, precision, and then destroyer. And they rotate, each one of them has a different effect in game. It's kind of cool. Uh, and they rotate with you those on the fly on the battlefield. So if they're like, 
you know, chopping up little chaff units, right, the, the endless hordes of people who are rebelling against them, they can use, switch from one aspect to that and all of a sudden they hit something bigger like, say, a Stormcast Eternal and immediately respond and change tactics as is appropriate. Now, when they're not on the battlefield or on the front lines, uh, these actually act as the foremost guards of the giant necropolis fortresses. So they're, they're a site that you could see relatively like a lot. You know, you, you, it, you would see the army coming with them. And then if you went to one of their fortresses to pay the tithe, you would also see them there. Now, alongside of those are the Immortus Guard. These uh, built from the same kit, I believe. And then the second bodyguard option next to the Morgast Archai. And they are dead set on defending the leadership of the Ossiarch Bone Reapers. And I'll be honest with you, there's not a lot of lore here that's very straightforward of just like, uh, we took the best people who are good at defending and that's pretty much it. But I absolutely love this unit. In fact, it is my favorite aesthetically uh, of unit in the entire faction. They're made from these souls that are focused on servitude and sacrifice rather than necessarily being a warrior, but to fulfill their purposes, they do use shields and spears as weapon. And, and their role really is to instinctively intercept any blows that are intended for their masters and fight off any enemy with a one-two punch of, you know, you, you thrust the spear into the enemy and then they also are masters of the shield bash, using that as a weapon as well instead of just defensive. And now this is where designs get a little bit more hellish because we're going to be talking about the Mortec Crawler. This interesting war machine, I guess you can call that, was designed by Catacros personally. He actually has the original blueprint uh, and hangs in a place of honor within his own fortress to this day. And it is a revolting sight. It's a living war machine, right? A catapult monster that uses several little legs moving like a centipede to crawl across the battlefield. The idea of seeing this thing in motion is both horrifying and kind of sounds awesome. There's not really a mention of what souls go into it, which is kind of unusual. They've kind of pointed that out in every other entry, but I assume things like beasts of burden and, and stuff like that, things that are very mindless and don't have a problem, you know, carrying huge burdens and being ordered to go a different directions, stuff like that. Atop of each of the Mortec crawlers is a small crew to guide its fire. These are not made from warrior souls, but things like navigators and engineers and laborers from people who have the optimal skills to load the firing arm and kind of gauge the ranges of the enemy and also, most importantly, to decide what kind of ammunition is the most effective against them. It can launch just about anything from a block of cursed steel, a container of screaming souls, or a cluster of skulls may have death magic at the enemy. It has a lot of versatility, um, and you just kind of see it plodding along like a little battering ram, you know, scraping across the surface of the ground, almost like it was a giant termite coming towards you. Uh, very cool looking model. And the last unit here is the Gothazar Harvester, undoubtedly one of the sickest models in the Ossiarch Bone Reaper line. And they really exemplify the theme of the faction, and I can't emphasize this enough. The theme being to create and destroy at the same time. It destroys enemies very efficiently, but it does so for the express purpose of creating new Ossiarch Bone Reaper units. And they, they, they function as massive bipedal constructs. They're hyper aggressive. They're used as line breakers, much like the ones we talked about earlier, crashing into the enemy at full speed. They have these huge upper body arms and they're either tipped with clubs made out of like raw realm of metal realm stone or their scything talons just keep going through enemy and they're all like, they stay constantly sharp with Shyishan magic. Regardless of what they're armed with though, they carve into the enemy with this kind of feral joy and that makes them super destructive. But their dual purpose is to harvest, right? Obviously it's in the name. Uh, the kid harvests the key resource of the army and that is of course, bones. As they're hacking and slashing through the enemy, You'll see on the model, there's tiny little secondary arms all over it, and it's gross looking. Uh, and, and they cover the sides and the back, and they're constantly picking up the remains of the dead that the main arms have just shredded in half or something. These little arms are picking up body parts, really, ripping the flesh off and loading the bones into this giant rib cage container on its back. 
So if you can imagine this from an aerial view, I imagine I was thinking about this, like what would this thing actually look like in combat, right? It makes a straight line into the enemy and behind it, it leaves a trail of blood, gore, and sinew, right? Because the bones are actively being harvested. So you're not even seeing like dead bodies. You're seeing like a body that's been, you know, turned into like jelly material because the bones got ripped out and they tore them inside out just to leave us, you know, gore on the ground right there for you. It's so sick. The more I thought about it, I was like, this is super savage. <laughs> And generally they return post-battle uh, to the Mortisons with the bones, right? They're just big carriers, basically. But if the need arises, they can actually use the bones straight from their back. Meaning, you know, typically they kind of go out and do their own thing. At the after the battle, they come back and then kind of deposit their whatever they've harvested. But if the need arises mid-battle, the harvester can kind of fall back a little bit and the Mortisons will make new constructs on the fly during the battle using the things that they've gathered. And they can do this mid-battle to repair damaged fighters, which is pretty much what they kind of, um, that's what the mechanics kind of represent as mid-battle repair. But fundamentally, uh, they're just, they're gonna be out front tearing things apart. It's insane and it's gross and I love it, right? It's just a lawnmower that collects bones and leaves people paste in a red trail. Now, why are these units cool? As we kind of wrap up, uh, I still have one more video I wanna do on the Bone Reapers about their individual legions, but why are these units cool? Well, there's not a lot behind many of them. Meaning like, you know, they don't have the same amount of lore. Um, the mounts and artillery being living things, I thought was a really nice touch, right? They're, they're not just, um, you know, beasts of burden jammed inside things like, no, no, no. Like the, the crawler is unique because it was designed by the Mortark himself, as opposed to the other Mortarks. I don't know of anything that they've personally designed like themselves in a big way. Maybe Arcan did something like that, but for the most part, like, you know, Lady Ollander, we don't know of anything. She designed anything at all. She's just leading an army that she was given. So the fact that Catacros has such a hands-on development mentality when it comes to this faction is really, really neat, as well as things like the mounts being a constant reminder, also the Morgast Archive, of like, this is the price of failure. You're constantly being watched and graded for what you say and how you achieve things, and there's this ever-present threat that you will fail and you will be punished for failure. The, the real winner for me, though, is the bigger constructs that push the bounds of design, right? Like, you know, if you, if you really could, you know, have a substance like clay and make, you know, the perfect army, why would it just look like humans? I wanted to see more of these big, ugly things that are just crazy out there, you know, designs that work on the battlefields of the mortal realms, but maybe wouldn't make much sense to us here on Earth. I love it. I think, I think really honestly, the Goth is our harvester, like typifies that, but the crawler does a great job as do the, the dual kits of the Immortus Guard and the Stalkers. Now, if I had to uh, make a Ossiarch Bone Reaper army myself, I would probably do a lot of cavalry because because I like the models and I like the, the number of models that you could build an army with, that kind of stuff. But let me ask you this, what is your favorite unit? Tell me down below. And if you think uh, one of them stands out as being incredibly cool lore-wise, I'd love to hear about it. And we'll continue the conversation in the comments below. Thank you all so much for watching. Look forward to seeing you in my next Age of Sigmar lore video and happy wargaming.